Right. I think we can uh, we can start now. So uh, welcome everyone to today's webinar, which is part of the eAccess Forum on Climate Change, Macroeconomics and Finance. Uh, the forum is a community of researchers, regulators, and central bankers working on issues of climate change and the environment. The forum is also on Slack, where you will find all the new working papers, news, and conference information on the topic. You can join via the link posted in the chat. Uh, my name is Emanuele Campiglio. I'm an associate professor at the University of Bologna, and our speaker today will be Stefan Hallegat. Stefan is the lead economist of the World Bank Climate Change Group. He joined the World Bank in 2012 after 10 years of academic research. His research interests include the economics of natural disasters and risk management, climate change adaptation, urban policy and economics, climate change mitigation, and green growth. Stefan was a lead author of the fifth assessment report of the IPCC. He's the author also of dozens of articles published in international journals and of several books. He also led several important World Bank reports and the writing team of the Stern Stiglitz High Level Commission on Carbon Prices. So today he will give a talk titled The Real Economic Impact of Natural Disasters, Accounting for Distributional Impacts and Implications for Poverty. The event will be structured as follows. Stefan will speak for about 40 minutes. Please feel free to pose any questions in the chat during the presentation. If these are immediate clarification questions, I will uh, briefly interrupt the speaker to address the question. Otherwise, I will postpone uh, the deeper questions to the Q&A section. At that point, I will invite you to open your microphone and ask your questions directly to the speaker, or I can do it for you if you prefer so. Uh, before leaving the floor to our speaker, please let me remind you that the event will be recorded. And let me launch the usual poll of e-access webinars, which should appear right now. So we have uh, two questions. Uh, the first one goes like this. If you had to choose, how would you measure the economic cost of a disaster? And you have some options. And the second is who is experiencing the largest losses when affected by a disaster? So I will leave you now a few seconds to answer. Okay, cast your votes and the results should appear soon. Let's see. So, um, okay, quite divided audience on the first one. I guess that the winner here is we need a better indicator. And the second in the ranking is impact on consumption. This was the measure of uh, economic so cost of a disaster and a clear 100% uh, answer for what concerns the second question. So Stefan, I hope uh, these are uh, useful and they can inspire your talk. And with this, I will uh, give you the floor and thank you again for being with us. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation, and thanks to uh, everybody in the audience for, for taking the time uh, for this uh, for this seminar. Um, I will talk about distributional impact of natural disasters. Uh, this is a topic that, in a sense, is emerging. Uh, we don't have a very uh, long record. We have uh, limited data. Uh, we have limited modeling. Uh, so this is really like. Uh, work in progress, and I will. Uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion after this talk and to uh, any feedback you might have on the uh, on the approach and any idea on on how we can uh, continue working on on those issues. Um, I will um, share my screen. Uh, please let me know if you can't see um, 
my uh, my screen now with this uh, with this title of the economics of, of disasters. I want to, to start very briefly with, with a little bit of motivation on how and why we, we started working on, on this, this question of how to measure the impact of, of disasters. Uh, and it, it really um, starts from a very common situation at the World Bank. You have different projects. So here you can imagine that you have two different coastal protection projects uh, and you have budgets only for one. So you want to decide which one is the best project and you run your numbers as any good economist. Um, the two projects cost about the same 100 million, uh, but the first one prevents 20 million in losses per year. And the second one prevents only 5 uh, million dollars in losses per year. From those numbers, not very complicated. Project A is much better and you uh, move forward with that one until you do your field visits and you realize project A is protecting a very fancy neighborhood with very nice cars and houses. And the second one is protecting a very poor neighborhood with thousands of people living in very difficult uh, situation. But because they have very few assets, they have very limited wealth. <clears throat> of course, protecting them in economic terms don't give you big numbers. And the World Bank being an institution dedicated to reducing poverty, of course, uh, it's not particularly satisfying that using those metrics would lead us uh, to our project A and not project B. So we, we were trying to think about different ways of, uh, of measuring the impact of disasters that would not create this bias favoring places with uh, more wealth and wealthy people. Um, how, how to do that? Well, we started from very basic risk assessment. So <clears throat> I don't know if, if you're familiar with, with uh, the basics of, of risk assessment, but very briefly, uh, we tend to assess the asset losses. So when you have a disaster, uh, looking at what has been damaged or destroyed and how much it costs to repair. And we do that by combining information on what we call the hazard, which is for instance, a hurricane, so it's a physical event. And we combine that with information about what we call exposure, which is the population and the assets being affected and the vulnerability of the assets and, and, and population. And when you combine all of that, you can uh, estimate asset losses. And that's when you have a disaster, uh, like this is for Hurricane Maria, for instance, the next day in all of the newspapers, you have these big numbers, like $43 billion in losses, this is usually done by, by combining those informations. Uh, and we do that systematically, and that's the number that is used, that's the number that we use to measure the severity of disasters that everybody's talking about. But when you compare like Puerto Rico and 43 billion and uh, Hurricane Irma on Antigua and Barbuda with $300 million in losses, you realize it doesn't really tell you much about what it does to people. Is $43 billion a lot, a lot or like $300 million a lot? Um, it's very abstract, it's very aggregated, and it's uh, very difficult to understand the severity of the disaster. So what we proposed is to add a fourth block to this framework. Um, this fourth block we call socioeconomic resilience, and it basically measures the ability of the population to experience asset losses, so to have houses damaged and road destroyed and factory uh, unable to produce, the ability to cope with those losses and to recover from them. And the goal is to calculate something that is not a loss in, in assets, but a loss in well-being. And I'll come back to that later because, of course, uh, this uh, creates definitional uh, issues. But really, the idea is to add this, this fourth block and to, to keep the rest of the, of the, the framework unchanged. Uh, how do we define this socioeconomic resilience? Well, if you can assess asset losses and if you can assess the well-being losses and you make the ratio of those two values, you get what we define as socioeconomic resilience. So if your resilience is zero, any loss in assets has an infinite impact on well-being. Uh, so not being resilient at all means that if you lose anything, you're basically dead. Uh, if your resilience is infinity, it means that you can lose any amount of assets and your well-being won't be uh, affected because you can cope, you can manage, it's okay, it doesn't affect 
uh, your quality of life. Um, and so between zero and plus infinity, we have this metric that can quantify the ability of the population to cope with disasters. So it's good to define that, but how do we measure well-being losses or social economic resilience? This will be uh, the, the main topic of, of our discussion today. Well, what we do is we do everything at the household level. So the basic starting point is that the unit that experience disasters is a family. And that resilience is really something that can to be calculated. You need to look at what happens to, to families and households. So we start from the assets and the income sources that households have. Uh, so the type of housing they have, the type of, um, uh, for instance, livestock in, in this case, but of course in richer countries, it will be depending on whether the people are like entrepreneurs and they own their own firm or they have wages from a factory, uh, all of these characteristics and also the characteristics in terms of the tools people have to manage a shock. So uh, whether their revenues are very diversified or if they have just one source of revenue, if they have savings, they have access to borrowing, uh, if they have market insurance in case of disasters, and of course this big block that you see on the slide here, which is adaptive social protection. So uh, whether households are covered by social protection systems that can help them when they are affected by disaster. So what will define the, the resilience of a household and therefore of a population will be their assets, their source of income, and the financial tools they have to deal with a disaster. So when we assess resilience for a country, we start from household surveys. So in the Philippines, for instance, I, I will use that example. We have a survey with 40,000 households. So the population of the country is defined by uh, 40,000 households. Each one has a weight, which is how much it represents in the population. And we know the income of the household, its composition, how many retirees, how many children, how many working adults. And we have information about where they live for their exposure. And we have uh, information about the type of assets they have, which we can translate into an asset vulnerability. And we also know from those household surveys, whether they can borrow, whether they have savings, whether they're covered by social protection. This is really the, the starting point of our estimates. So if I take one region in the Philippines, for instance, Cagayan Valley, uh, this is the distribution of consumption in this region, according to the uh, household survey. And what we will try to do is to assess when there is a disaster affecting this region, how is the distribution of consumption shifted? So how much consumption is being lost, but also who is losing uh, consumption, who is affected, uh, and how the distribution and the, the distribution of income, distribution of consumption in the population will be affected by the shock. So we do that by uh, modeling the full causal chain. So we have the, the hazard. So let's, let's assume we talk about a, a hurricane, or I should say a, a typhoon if it's in the Philippines. We know the area affected. So we know the households in our 40,000 households who are affected, and we can assess how much asset losses they will experience, damages to the house and so on. And of course here, um, one thing which is really important is that to make a living, people have the uh, assets they own, their private assets. It will be their, their dwelling, and in many places it might be livestock, but it's also all of the equipment, it will be cars, uh, so things that the households own to, to make a living. But they are also dependent on assets that they don't own, but they make a living from. And the typical example is a factory. If I'm working uh, in a factory and the factory is destroyed, I don't own the factory, but my income might well be affected. And they also depend on public assets. So maybe my house is fine, maybe my factory is fine, but the road is in between, is destroyed, I cannot get there, and so my livelihood is threatened too. So when we look at the asset impacts, we're not looking at the assets that the households own, but we're uh, looking at the assets that the households use to make a living. 
and it, it, some of them they own and some of them they don't. But this is really, really important because uh, if you're looking only at the assets that uh, households own, you're really not looking at what happens to their job and opportunities to uh, have an income. So to, once we have an assessment of the impact on the assets, we can translate that into the impact on income. Uh, and this is extremely challenging to do. Uh, I don't know how much you have looked into that, that question, but uh, when we're looking at uh, specific disasters, we can do extremely sophisticated modeling. Uh, this uh, image is just as an illustration uh, uh, that we can assess depending on which road is affected, what will be the impact on the economy, what will be the impact on supply chains and so on. But of course, um, and for a lot of us in, in, uh, in, in this seminar, uh, when we apply those tools in more or less operational manners, uh, we don't have the time and the, 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 the data to do the full analysis. So we rely on simplified methodologies to try to understand how asset losses will translate into income losses. And I won't go too much into the, the details of the, the modeling here, but there's one thing which is really, really important here is if you just take your average macroeconomic model and you assume that because the disaster is destroying capital, let's say $1 billion of capital, that you can just model, model that by reducing capital by, by 1 billion, the assumption that you're making is that basically only the least productive capital is being affected. Uh, and the loss will be the marginal productivity of capital multiplied by, by the, uh, the asset loss. But in practice, uh, not only the least productive capital is being affected. Um, uh, the, the damages will affect sometimes a very little road in a very remote places. Sometimes it will affect the big bridge that connects all of your economy together. So in, when we assess how the loss of capital affects income, uh, we don't use the marginal productivity of capital, but we use the average productivity of capital, which basically is the assumption that damages are random and that you cannot reallocate your, your capital to, uh, to minimize your losses. So this is a really important point because the impact of a disaster is not only a reduction in your stock of capital, it's also uh, a misallocation of the capital that's left. So after a disaster, you, you have not only a loss in capital, but you have also a loss of, uh, of total factor productivity because your capital is, is misallocated. And this is something that is well observed in data that the impact of disasters is not only a loss of capital, but also a loss in total factor productivity. But in, uh, in many of the papers you will see published, uh, disasters are modeled only as a reduction in, in the stock of capital, which is, uh, which is a, a huge underestimation of the, uh, of the impact. So basically up to now, very simple, right? You, for each of your households, you assess how much assets are affected, and then you translate that into income losses by multiplying the stock of assets that are affected by the average productivity of capital. Another question is to see how the loss in income will be translated into a loss in consumption, which is at the end of the day what matters for people. And here uh, you have to look at the full reconstruction phase because for households, the impact of a disaster will be a loss in income, like the factory is affected or the economy is completely disrupted for three weeks. And I, I'm like a, a restaurant and I don't have any clients, but there is also an impact due to the need to reconstruct. So if my roof has been damaged, I will have to spend $5,000 to fix my roof. So if we're thinking about the impact on consumption, there is part of the impact linked to the income, part of the impact, and it's very often the biggest part uh, linked to the cost of repairing or replacing assets that have been affected and the impact on consumption will be reduced by the amount of savings or my ability to borrow after a disaster. And all households will have a trade-off to make. Um, if you have a lot of money, you can 
reconstruct and replace all of your assets tomorrow. But if you are a poor household, you cannot spend too much in reconstruction because then you have nothing left for your normal consumption. And if you cannot rebuild very quickly, it means that your reconstruction period will be longer. So when we model the impact of disasters at the household level, uh, we assume that households will do this trade-off uh, depending on how much resources they have and depending on whether they can access borrowing or not. They will be able to rebuild very quickly and have a big hit on their, uh, on their savings or in consumption. Or if they don't have those resources, what they will do is they will delay reconstruction, make it happen over a very long period of time, which will magnify the impact of the disaster. Uh, and this is really important because when we discuss the financial tools that people have to, um, that we can offer to households and firms, um, insurance, emergency borrowing, or even cash transfers like government stepping in when like in the US you have FEMA giving grants to people being affected. Uh, the impact is not only that you protect people's consumption, that they will be able to use the grants to, to, to maintain the consumption level, but what you can do also is to make it easier for people to rebuild faster, which means that your economy will be back faster and the total macroeconomic impact of the disaster will be reduced. So those tools that we discuss quite a lot, uh, like insurance or emergency borrowing, have a, a microeconomic benefit, helping households maintain consumption, and a macroeconomic benefit, helping the entire economy uh, repair quicker, and uh, therefore minimizing uh, losses in terms of, of GDP and, and, and macro impact. So that's, in a nutshell, the, the modeling we're doing for, for consumption. We, we assess asset losses, then we move to the uh, income impacts at the household level, then we look at how households will allocate their residual income between consumption, repairs, and, and saving. And this is how we, uh, we can estimate what I showed at the beginning, how the full distribution of consumption will be shifted uh, to the left. Uh, and here we have, in many countries, we're using those poverty lines. Uh, so here in the Philippines, they are using two lines. One is the subsistence line, uh, which is basically how much you need to spend for basic access to, to, to food and shelter. And there is a poverty line. And we can calculate for a given disaster uh, how the distribution shifts and therefore what the disaster does to poverty. So in the case of a typhoon in this region, for instance, uh, we have about 200,000 people falling in poverty uh, in the region. In terms of communication and risk management in the sense, telling people about risks and helping them understand the value of investing uh, in risk mitigation or investing in, in, in coping mechanisms. Uh, my experience is that those numbers in terms of poverty headcounts uh, are very, very useful because it's very difficult to understand if this $43 billion is a lot or not, depending on the context. But 200,000 people falling in poverty, it's, it's very easy to understand the, the scale of the impact. So it really gives a good complementary metric that we can use to communicate about, about risk and about the benefit of, of risk management, of course. But even, even there, uh, the problem we have is, so asset losses tend to favor the richest because they are the ones owning assets. Uh, but a poverty metric looks only at the people close to poverty. Uh, so what we try to do is to calculate these well-being losses, this, this estimate of uh, the, the effect of disasters on well-being. Um, and this is a very, very simple uh, uh, metric that, that we use. We simply uh, use basic welfare theory and we have a marginal utility of consumption that depends on your consumption before the, the disaster. What this marginal utility of consumption represents is the fact that losing consumption means very different things for households at the different at a, at a different poverty level. So uh, if, if I'm losing $5,000 because I have to fix my roof, um, I have a lot of luxury consumption that I can um, uh, reduce so that I can repair and I won't feel 
the impact very much. Uh, if Bill Gates is losing five thousand uh, dollars, he probably won't know it. Uh, but for a poor farmer in Ethiopia, five thousand dollars might might be the difference between uh, subsistence and and non subsistence. Uh, so the elasticity of the marginal utility of consumption, uh, this parameter is a really, really important one because it translates the fact that the type of consumption that will be affected by the disaster is very different, ranging from luxury consumption to uh, essential basic needs that, that can threaten the, uh, the long-term uh, survival of a household. And we have a lot of evidence that uh, poor households have when affected by disasters have to cut on food intake, so the, the calories, uh, and for adults it's okay, but for children it can have permanent impacts, but they also cut on healthcare. We see the drop in, um, in um, uh, doctor visits, for instance, after disasters, and they have to cut on education. And one number I, I, I use quite a lot is in, in Mexico, when a kid is out of school because of a disaster, 30% of the time, the kid would never go back to school. So for those households, it's not like you have a disaster and then a recovery period, but if a kid drops out of school and never come back, it's the entire uh, life of one individual that, that will be changed. So this elasticity of the marginal utility of, of consumption, sorry, very technical term, sometimes difficult to discuss with policymakers, uh, but a very important one because it impacts a lot of the impact of, of disasters. So this is what we're doing. So we're modeling this full causal chain at the household level. And at the end, we re-aggregate asset losses, we re-aggregate well-being losses, and we can make a division and have an assessment of the resilience of the population. So how does it work in practice? This is an example in the, in the Philippines. Um, in the Philippines, we were um, um, asked by the government for support because they had created uh, a, a disaster risk management fund, and they were wondering how to define priorities in, in regional terms. So where should that fund be invested? But they were also interested in um, how to allocate this fund between prevention so before the disaster to reduce the risk and ex post support to the population being affected. And so we used all of this machinery that I just described to try to inform this uh, decision. And what we did is to uh, apply this tool on the country at the regional level. And this is basically a very short summary of what we found. So if you're looking at asset risks, this is a map that you see on the left here. Uh, what you see is Manila and its region. So you have the capital of the country. This is where wealthy populations are. This is where most of the assets are located. So if you want to use your disaster risk management funds to reduce asset losses, you want to invest in the Manila area. If your fund is supposed to protect people so that they don't fall in poverty, then you have a different picture. And you have some other areas, uh, especially on the Eastern Shore, uh, places with very high levels of poverty, which are becoming priorities. Um, so here, depending on how you define your policy objective in terms of risk management, you'll find a very different uh, priority. If you use this indicator that we created, this uh, well-being risk, um, then you have something which is a little bit in between. And for us, it's a good tool because uh, we don't want to look only at poverty. Uh, we know that it's also good to reduce asset losses uh, uh, because economically it, it makes a lot of sense. So here we have something which is sort of an in between between the two. And the last figure I wanted to show you is socioeconomic resilience. And here it's really interesting because the, 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 the map is very, very different with the south of the country being the place with the lowest resilience. But as you see on the other maps, the south of the country is not a place with very high risk. So the south of the country here is a place that is not affected very much by typhoon and other disasters in the country. But when they are affected, uh, they struggle very much to recover. 
So those four maps, we use quite a lot in our engagements with the government to basically they asked us help to allocate a fund. And our answer was, what is your objective with that fund? Is that to um, do like a pure like economic maximization and to reduce losses? Is it to protect poor people? Is it something in between to um, uh, minimize the impact of disasters on well-being? Or do you want to do something slightly different, which is to make your population resilient, regardless of whether they are affected very often or not? And depending on your choice, you'll have a very different uh, list of priorities in, in your country. What we also found, and I will come back to the, the question in the poll, is uh, here you have the asset loss in the Philippines for the five quintiles, from the poorest to the wealthiest. So the, the question in the poll was whether poor people or rich people were, um, were uh, losing, who is losing the most? And in fact, this question is sort of meaningless because if you're looking at asset losses, rich people tend to lose more in absolute, in, in US dollars, because they are so much richer that they are the ones uh, that can afford to lose a lot. If you're using a welfare-based metric, then poor people will be losing the most. So in, in the question, then 100% of the audience answered that the poor uh, were the, the most affected. It suggests that the metric that you use in your mind is a well-being metric. You're not using a, a metric which is a pure economic metric in terms of asset loss. Otherwise, you would have said that the richest. Um, so here, it's, it's very important to, to distinguish this this um, asset losses in absolute in US dollars, uh, asset losses in relative terms, so percentage of your wealth that is being lost in the disaster. In relative terms, it's also the poorest or well, the most affected. And well being losses, which is even more the poorest being affected because not only they are losing more in relative terms, but also they have less capacity to recover. Um, in terms of, of policy, it means that if you're doing a cash transfer after a disaster, even if you don't try to be very uh, precise and to target very well, you just do a transfer of fund of the same amount to everybody, um, you, you will help poor people much more because for them, the, even the, the small amount will make a bigger difference. And the benefit cost ratios of uh, those cash transfers will be very, very high. So. In all of the cases, we looked at the benefit cost ratios of using taxes to help after a disaster with, uni with uniform transfers. Uh, we have benefit cost ratios which are uh, bigger than three and, and, and sometimes bigger than five. Um, and here in, in policy terms, it's very important because in many countries, even when the government helps people after the disaster, the support they give to the households is proportional to the losses, which means that rich people get much more. So if you want to use public funds very efficiently, you don't want to help people after a disaster proportionally to what they have lost, but you want to use a different system so that um, you don't help the richest part of your population much more than you help the, the poorest. So here, we have this machinery that we can use to test many different uh, uh, policy post-disasters. So just taking stock of, of the story so far. So we have the normal way of doing risk management and risk assessments that assesses asset losses. Uh, we propose to look at the capacity of the population to recover the socioeconomic resilience so that we can calculate something which is closer to well-being losses. And this helps us really think about the policies to avoid disasters, like uh, land use planning, building norms, all of those prevention-based solutions. But also, whatever we do to prevent risks, there will always be natural disasters. There will always be impacts on populations. So we also have to think about how to help people manage residual risks with insurance, with borrowing, with savings. And the, the, if you have an assessment that looks not only at assets, but also at the impact on consumption, poverty, and well-being, 
you can really look at those two pillars of risk management, prevention and increasing your uh, capacity to cope uh, ex post. So this is a tool that we have deployed in about 20 countries now uh, to inform uh, policies. To, to, to conclude my presentation, I just wanted to shift gear a little bit and to move from natural disasters today to climate change with a 2030 time horizon. So what climate change will do in, uh, in 2030. And I won't go very much into the details of the methodology because it's, it's the same story. We start from household surveys and we simulate the impact of climate change uh, on each of the households at the micro level. And therefore we make the difference between impacts affecting the type of cities you see on the left and the type of cities you see on the right. Um, and of course, um, the, the difference in impacts is largely driven by the vulnerability of populations uh, much more than by the, 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 the physics of, of climate change. So in the exercise I will discuss now, uh, we're looking at five different channels. So five different ways climate change will affect households. And I've in big red letters that this is not comprehensive in the sense that we're not covering all of the, the channels, of course, but we're looking at the impact of climate change through uh, food prices. So the fact that you have an increase in the price of food and that acts as reducing the available income for households. And of course, because poor people spend a lot in food, uh, for a lot of poor households in the world, uh, about 60, 70% of their resources will be spent on food, which is very different from the 15, 20% that we find in, in most developed countries. Uh, so we're looking at, at this impact. Uh, we're also looking at the impact that um, climate change will have on agricultural income for farmers. Um, we're also looking at the impact of climate change through higher temperatures on labor productivity outside. So in sectors like uh, construction, uh, agriculture, tourism, um, this, this type of, uh, of occupations. Uh, we're looking at natural disasters. So all of what I discussed just before. And we're looking at health. And here we're looking at three things. We're looking at malaria. We're looking at diarrhea, which is a shortcut for all of the waterborne disease and uh, child stunting. So the fact that when kids don't have enough uh, food when they are uh, young, uh, they, are, uh, they have a reduced development, both physically and cognitively, and therefore lower income for the rest of their life. And the right-hand side columns is a random list of things that we don't uh, take into account, just to uh, remind you that this is far from being a, a complete estimate. And, and this is the result if you do that in uh, about 90 countries, 90 developing countries, uh, where you have in a, a pessimistic scenario, so pessimistic in terms of development and pessimistic in terms of climate change for 2030, about 130 million people uh, in poverty in 2030 only because there is climate change. Um, and you see that you have like Nigeria and India being two big hotspots, mostly because they are these massive countries uh, with very big populations. If you look in relative terms, uh, then you see Africa jumping at you. Uh, between now and 2030, uh, the region where we expect to see a lot of the impact of uh, climate change and poverty is uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, which uh, probably won't uh, surprise you too much. If we're looking at the different channels, uh, so this is the channel linked to food prices. Uh, you see that food prices will be affecting poverty largely in Sub-Saharan Africa, but also in, um, in, uh, in South Asia, uh, especially, uh, especially India. Uh, this is the impact through farmer incomes. And here you see that most of the farmers in the world will be expected to benefit from uh, climate change by 2030. The reason is that you have an increase in food prices. So even though there is a decrease in the quantity being produced, if you can sell for more, um, you can benefit. And the big 
uh, uh, exception is Sub-Saharan Africa because the place is, is more affected on average than the rest of the world. The impact through health is much more distributed across the world, uh, including in, in Latin America and, and all of, of uh, East Asia. And this is uh, the impact that is less poverty dependent compared with, uh, with others. So here, I just want to conclude uh, with this, this work on the distributional impact of, of, um, of climate change uh, on the importance of the assumption we're making regarding development. Uh, so if I'm uh, assessing the impact of climate change on poverty, assuming that development is kind of like uh, uh, stable compared with what we uh, uh, have been saying recently. And this is a study done before COVID. So right now, what was pessimistic two years ago uh, sounds just about where we are at the moment. We have this estimate of uh, 132 million people falling in poverty by 2030 due to climate change. But if you assume that we do better in terms of development, and there is a list of things on the, on the right hand side of this slide, like if we do better on healthcare and coverage, if we do better in, um, in getting people access to saving and borrowing, uh, if we do better in terms of productivity growth, um, the same climate change would put only, only quote unquote, 62 million people in, in poverty. So here really the point is that the impact of climate change, even between now and 2030, depends not only on how the temperature will change, how rainfall will change, how disasters will change, but it depends a lot on what we're doing in terms of, of development and in terms of economic and development policies, which is the good news that we can still do a lot to protect populations uh, against, against disasters. Um, you wouldn't see such an impact if you were only looking at GDP impact. And that's because if you're looking at the impact of climate change only in terms of GDP, you're mostly looking at what happens to rich people. So for me, the value, and I want to conclude on that, the value of looking at distributional impacts uh, is not only that it's a better measure of the impact on people's quality of life, but also that it shows you a lot of opportunities for good policies that you wouldn't see if you were to focus on, on GDP or aggregate metrics. And I think for, for, for you, working much, mostly at the macro level, using mostly macroeconomic models, CGEs, macrostructural models, uh, improving the connection between those models and household level macro simulations, macroeconomic models, looking at what happens within firms, within households, could add a lot of value, not only to understand the, the impact of different choices, but also to be able to design the, the, the policies so that they are more efficient. Uh, I think this is a, a very promising research domain, uh, and we will keep investing in that domain. And we're, we're always very open to collaboration. So uh, now we have a little bit of time for the, for the discussion. Any idea about how we could uh, work together uh, would be super welcome from, from my side. And, and uh, also, I want to remind that all of the models that we have and so on, everything is, is available for anybody to, uh, to use if there is an interest. So thanks again for your, uh, uh, for your interest and thanks to the organizers uh, for the uh, invitation and uh, looking forward to your questions now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan. That was uh, a fascinating talk. Um, we already have some questions. So I would uh, uh, please ask um, any of you who has questions to put them in the Q&A or to raise your hand or to do both. That would be uh, the ideal so we, we can track you. And um, I would start uh, if uh, Jaideep uh, uh, Oberoi um, uh, is still with us then. I would ask him to pose his question. It would be great also if you could maybe state who you are and your affiliation. 
Uh, Stefan, while we wait to see if uh, JDP is, is available, um, it, uh, would you rather um, aggregate uh, questions uh, together, uh, three or four, or do you prefer to respond to, to them? I think there is only two for the moment, so maybe we can take them one by one, and uh, if there are more, we can aggregate. Yes, there are there are more in the uh, in the chat as well. Ah. But so uh, JDP, uh, let me let me read you um, his question. Um, uh, Mike isn't working. No worries, JDP. I, I can put it. I can uh, ask for you. So all these impacts have different time horizons. Does this matter? Similarly, does resilience relate to the time taken to recover? I, I would also add maybe a time related question. Uh, what is your um, time dimension? Yeah, when 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 modeling these uh, these impacts, for instance, when when you were showing the Indonesia case. Um, what kind of time horizon did that uh, take into account and what kind of modeling do you have behind? Yeah, no, that's, that's, a, that's a, a very uh, good and important question. Um, so, I mean, first on the, on the modeling, uh, in, the, in the simulation I showed for, for natural disasters, uh, we have a time horizon, which is in most cases about 10 years. Uh, which we need for the biggest disasters. So of course, most of the small disasters that happen regularly, uh, people tend to, to recover and rebuild in one, two, three years. Uh, but to represent well the very long disasters that you have to go to, to, to about 10 years. Um, and just for the modelers that we use a, a weekly uh, time step so that we're looking at the impact week after weeks over, over 10 years. And so the, the, the different time horizons of the impacts is really, really important. Uh, you have during the disaster where in most cases, everything is disrupted and stopped. Then you have uh, the recovery and reconstruction period, which can last, as I said, up to about 10 years, depending on, on the resources available to rebuild. Uh, and then there is the longer term impacts, uh, which are also really important. And I, I mentioned uh, the fact that poor households often had to cut on food, education, and health. Uh, one of the reasons why those uh, impacts are so costly is because they have an impact beyond the reconstruction of the assets. So if your kid is dropping out of school, even when you have replaced your, your roof and you have got your job back and everything is back to normal, uh, you might have an, an, an impact that is permanent. Uh, similarly, uh, people with disability, for instance, uh, can have uh, that, that can have an impact that's, uh, that's permanent. So because we don't model more than 10 years, uh, we represent those longer term uh, effects uh, 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 basically by using the net present value of the lost income, for instance, when a kid is, is dropping out of school. Uh, resilience is very much linked to the time taken to recover in the sense that the quicker the recovery, the lower the uh, impact on GDP and, and consumption. So uh, resilience is really very much about two things. It's about limiting the drop in consumption at the time of the shock and bringing the reconstruction phase as short as possible. So I think it's a good summary of what we're trying to do. And if, if you're thinking about what insurance is doing, it's really trying to do those two things. Very quickly bringing money to people so that they don't have to cut consumption and helping them reconstruct that your economy is back to normal very quickly. Um, one, one thing that's, that's really important here also is that um, in all of the simulations I showed, if, Every disaster is independent. So you have your normal economy, you have the shock, you recover back to where you were. Of course, the real world is very different. If, if you're in the Philippines, you have 10, 20 disasters per year. And so people are affected by, by multiple shocks, which uh, is not captured in uh, what I showed you. Thank you, Stefan. Um, so we now have a question by uh, Gabriele Pattumelli. Gabriele, uh, if you want to pose your question um, directly, uh, you should now be able to speak and you're welcome to. Uh, 
we're having issues with mics uh, today. Um, Ivan, um, Ivan Fayella, do, do you um, want to, if um, uh, the organizers can unmute Ivan, we can hear from him maybe? Can you hear me, Emanuele? Yes, yes. yes. Hello, Hi. Ivan. Sorry for that. Uh, uh, hi, Stefan. Really interesting and great presentation. I really uh, find that this mi micro perspective is, uh, you know, is giving you a lot of information also on the propagation channels. It's just not a matter of uh, re-aggregating with some sense uh, the results. I was just wondering, I put a, a, a question in, in the, in the Q&A. Do you, do you think that some of these channels also can affect uh, energy prices? I mean, not just uh, the effect of climate change in terms you know, of, of more, more extreme events, but in general, the effect of the process of you know, transitioning to zero uh, in the case, uh, uh, at least at the beginning, is going to cost money because it's mostly, uh, you, know, you need new capital equipment, you need new infrastructure. And I was just wondering, uh, I mean, I, I expecting also for example, in advanced countries, this is going to be uh, this cost is going to be uh, to bar them more vulnerable houses. You think it's the same also in emerging countries in uh, low and medium income countries? So this is a, this is a very good question, and we're using now the, exactly the same uh, tools and architecture to look at um, at the effects of decarbonization and points. I mean, can be carbon pricing, but in the uh, regulations making appliance more uh, expensive because they are more energy efficient, for instance. Uh, so we're, we're looking at that, but uh, th there is also a, a disaster related uh, link. Uh, if you're thinking about Brazil in 2001, they had this massive drought that lasts two years. And because the country is so dependent on hydropower, it made the price of electricity increase quite a lot in the country. And so disasters also can affect people through energy prices. Um, on your question about who is the most affected, um, so in, in rich countries, uh, poorer households tend to be uh, spending more of their budget in energy. Uh, but the difference between poor and rich is smaller than the difference uh, depending on occupation or depending on where people live. So it, it's more important to think in spatial terms. Like people in downtown will be using less energy than people in the suburbs and even less energy than people in rural areas. So the, the distributional issues are much more spatial than, than just based on the, the, the income they size. And that's, uh, if you're thinking about what, uh, what happened in, in France with the, the carbon price, the people contesting the, the carbon tax were mostly people living far away from city centers uh, most dependent on, on uh, individual cars to, to travel. Uh, in, in poor countries, uh, especially the very poor ones, we have a very different dynamics because we have the, most of the population very poor is not using fossil fuels very much. Uh, they're using a lot of biomass. And therefore in countries like that, if you tax fossil fuels, you will tax mostly the, the richest part of the population. But there is a very important consideration which is that uh, we really don't want to slow the process through which poor people shift from using biomass for cooking to using uh, uh, modern energy, it can be electricity or can be gas, because using biomass for cooking is, is killing millions of people per year because of indoor pollution. So in, in India, for instance, or, or in Africa, the idea is that if whatever happens to fossil fuels, uh, poor households should be either offered exemptions so that they can shift to gas and uh, have all of the health benefits, or if, if we want to shift to a decarbonized uh, um, energy, it has to be electricity, but the upfront cost is much higher, so it's specific measures are, are needed there. Uh, similarly, if you think of transportation, only rich, the richest in very poor countries have a car, so uh, they will be the ones affected more than, more than poor people. Uh, but, but that is only for very poor people. If, even if you go to middle income countries, uh, right now you have a, a, a poor urban middle class who has access to a vehicle and, and would be affected. 
But I think that the short story is it's very context dependent. Uh, we have to be very careful because we don't want any climate policy to uh, affect negatively poor people who are already in living uh, a difficult life. And that we cannot look at distributional impacts of those policies only by looking at income decides. We really need to look at spatial impacts too. So I don't know if it answers your question, but at least there are some elements. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, I would move uh, uh, to Mallory Bird, if she's with us. Hi, yes, I was wondering if the way that disasters are measured would change how immediate response is provided. So for instance, trying to prioritize more aid towards locations of low socioeconomic resilience instead of where we might see uh, locations of high asset losses that we know will have um, support later on. Um, so any of your thoughts there? Yeah, so it's, it's really a great question because uh, my experience after disasters is that governments are very often more concerned about getting the economy working quickly. Um, and it means that a lot of the resources are going more in urban places and more to the middle class and not so much toward the poorest and the most affected. And what we're trying to do is, is not so much to tell governments what they should do, but uh, we, what we want is to be able to help them understand the trade-offs that they face uh, during disasters. So if, if they want to help the middle class because they feel that the middle class is more important to get the economy back uh, on, on, on its feet, that's, that might be their choice. But having a good measure of the impact on poverty can also, also help them realize that by doing that, they are not helping people who might be in a very difficult position and with like even the survival being threatened. And what we realized is after disasters, because data collection takes at least three to six months, uh, a lot of governments are acting completely in the dark, uh, trying to provide support, but without really knowing uh, who needs what. And by using this type of models that we can run just after a disaster, uh, of course, it is not real data collected on the ground, but we can make almost real time estimates of who is affected and, and, and how, and help people make decisions even in the few weeks, few months before we have the time to, to run a data collection process and to know exactly who is affected and, and how. And, and therefore people can look at those trade-offs and decide if they want to use the resources they have to help the poorest or to just have different policy objectives, which is, uh, which is the, the decision of the government. But to, to answer your, your question, I think at the moment, uh, the discussion doesn't take place because people don't have the information to make the decision. So we hope that by promoting this type of assessments, especially in real time, we can get the post-disaster response better informed. And I have to, just to, to conclude on that, a lot of the people making the decisions in the rush during a disaster are not experts of, of crisis management and, and disaster impacts and might not realize the long-term impacts as soon as children get out of school or get deprived of, of basic uh, food intake, for instance. So bringing that information to the people making the decision is really important to us. Great. Uh, thank you, Stefan. Um, I'm afraid uh, our time uh, is, um, is over. Let me offer my apologies for all the people that uh, post questions, we will uh, forward them to uh, Stefan. And uh, of course, you're, you're free to, to write to him. I hope that's fine with you, Stefan. If you have any additional comments or questions, let me just remind you uh, the next event before we um, uh, close. So on uh, July uh, 12th, uh, we will have uh, Dirk Bröders uh, from the Nederlandsche Bank, the DMB, uh, who will present his recent paper climate change uncertainty and central bank risk management. So it should be interesting. Uh, let me uh, thank once again, uh, Stefan for being with us. Thank you, Stefan. And um, I'll see you all next time. Thank you very much and thank you all. Goodbye. <laughs>